We're going to start with some kind of, we're going to ask several questions this morning. So um, uh, sorry to do that to you, but I'm going to require you to do some thinking today as we step into Jonah chapter 4, as we've been a part of this series now uh, for the last six weeks. Um, And uh, hopefully you've been learning and growing as we're going through that series. I know I have been and learning some things about Jonah that I didn't know before, or at least that I had forgotten. Um, But today I want to kind of do some reflective questions that I want to start with. We're going to start with some questions, and then um, we're going to pause and talk a bit, and then we're going to come back and we're going to ask you uh, a few more questions. And so here's kind of the first question that I want you to think about. You don't need to really answer these questions out loud, but obviously I want you to ponder them and to reflect on them and then answer them in your own heart and mind as you think about those questions uh, today. So have you ever been angry with God? Just let that soak in for a bit really want you to think about that. Have you ever been angry with God? And when I created this question, I had a feeling that some of you wouldn't like the word angry because that almost sounds like we're uh, like, like disrespectful towards God. And I get that because that word angry is a tough one for me as well. And so I changed the word. And let's say, how many of you have ever been disappointed with God? So if you haven't a hard, if you haven't getting hung up by the word angry, what about disappointed? How many of you have ever been disappointed with God. Maybe God has allowed something in your life to transpire that you really weren't planning on. It wasn't on your agenda. It wasn't on the timeline of your life, but for some reason it happened. It fell in your lap, and now you're dealing with it. And you think that God could have stepped in and done something differently to prevent that from happening, but for some reason God didn't, and now you feel like you're left with the repercussions of God's decisions, right? So think about that question. Have you ever been disappointed with God? Maybe God has placed you in a difficult circumstance, one that really doesn't make any human sense at all to you, at least as you're going through that. Maybe you're feeling a bit alone. Maybe you're feeling a bit abandoned. Maybe you're feeling a bit confused. And so, again, let's link, uh, think about that question. Have you ever been disappointed with God? What I'm learning, and I'm sure you are learning if you've lived any length of time, is that God does not always do things the way that we would like Him to do things. His ways are not like our ways, as Scripture says. He doesn't always put us in easy situations. He doesn't always put us around easy people. Wouldn't that be nice, right? But He doesn't. Sometimes He places us in uncomfortable situations, even around people that are just unbearable. Let's just be real. Now, None of you have that problem, but there are times that we can be around people who are a bit unbearable. But God does not, and He will not in those moments, let you down. You may think that He does, but He won't. And the safest place to be is in the will of God. It's the safest place that you and I can be is in God's will. As uncomfortable as it may be, it's definitely the safest place that we can be. So, What if God has put you and I in these difficult situations, in these difficult places, around difficult people in order that His grace can shine through you, in order that His grace can be displayed through you as you interact with those difficult people around you, or as we're kind of saying today, so that God's invisible grace may become visible as you do life with other people? If any of those questions or statements um, at all on any level seem to kind of resonate with your heart this morning, then I trust that God and I trust that His Word, specifically Jonah chapter 4 as we study the details of it, is going to really minister to your heart today. And what I hope and pray will be just really, honestly, a profound moving of the Spirit's work in our heart. It's kind of been my my prayer this week, um, kind of wrestled um, through this. Um, And it's been a bit challenging, but it's been so, so good and rich for me, and I hope that you'll find um, God's Word to be rich uh, to you as well. But can we start with prayer? Um, Often we we do this. We haven't done it in a while. You know what I'm going to, just when I say that, you know exactly what what I mean. But we like to take our hands. We just like to open our hands. And if you feel comfortable doing this, you don't have to, but just something that you can do. Just take your hands and open them up and just kind of lay them um, palms up on your lap. And it's just this little symbol that it's just kind of gives us this visual of as we're about to study God's word that what we're saying is is that our our hands and our hearts are open this morning to listening to God's word. Can you you pray with me? Father, I 
I thank you so much for your word that uh, teaches us, for your word that is, is truth. In a world uh, today that is so confused on what truth is, it's so refreshing for us to be able to come every Sunday and read literal truth from your literal word. God, as we get ready to dive into chapter 4 of Jonah's autobiography, so to speak, his life, his accounting of his life, and the details of his heart as he wrestled with you, God, I pray that, that our hearts, as our hands are open right now, that our hearts and our minds would be open to listening intently to what it is that you want to teach each of us this morning. And we pray uh, that your spirit would move in our hearts, that you would challenge us, that we would be different because of what we encountered this morning as we encountered you and your grace uh, from your word. Uh, we thank you in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. I'm excited about this week's uh, message because, for one, we're in the last chapter of Jonah 4. We're not going to finish it uh, today. We still have one more week, so we're kind of cutting chapter 4 in half, so to speak. We're looking at these first four uh, verses and kind of refreshing our memory. This might be a little bit different from kind of how we've been handling the rest of, of uh, Jonah, but, but I, I trust that it will be um, just a, a learning experience for all of us. But this week, again, we get this opportunity to eavesdrop, and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. That's what's so cool about Jonah's story is that we, we get these little glimpses of, of Jonah in, interacting with God, right? And there's been moments where he's been running, there's been moments where he's been praying, um, and now we're going to see there's, there's some moments where he's going to be, he's disappointed, he's, he's angry, and I would even say he's furious, with God as we begin to look into chapter 4. And you and I have this opportunity to eavesdrop on this intimate conversation between Jonah and God. And these few verses that we're going to look at this morning, if you think about it, it this is like a, 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 rec a record of this intimate conversation, this private struggle between a man, a man named Jonah and the creator of the universe, who is God, right? And we get to eavesdrop in on that conversation and listen to him. And it's also cool to think about that what we hold on our laps, you know, God's word has been retained for us in ink, what's happened thousands of years ago, that, that we can read every single week and we can learn from it and pull from it and apply it to our lives practically to think that we have that opportunity to do that today is just awesome. And so God's inviting each of us into this story today to listen into this conversation that he's having with Jonah. There's going to be some times that you're going to hear how Jonah responds, and it's going to surprise you. There's going to be some times that you're going to just really connect with what Jonah's feeling and what he's saying, and I hope that kind of all of that happens across the board. And there are things in this passage that really should be encouraging to us. We should read this and be encouraged. But there are some, also some things, I think, in this passage that are going to be some warnings for us. God's going to give Jonah some warnings, and I think God's going to give us some warnings this morning as well. And I think part of what we are going to learn is that all of us, all of us, every person who is here in this room this morning, um, have similar situations where we are just like Jonah. And I think you all would agree so far throughout our study that you, you're finding, that, and we've been saying this each week, that we're more like Jonah than we care really to admit. And so this is going to be another chapter that's going to take us to another level of where I think we're going to agree and understand that. And we're going to find out that the issue that Jonah is dealing with in this moment of chapter 4 is so very similar to our struggle. And the struggle inside of Jonah is the struggle, again, that's inside of, I think, inside of each of us. And if you cannot admit that after our study is done today, then you just need to be more honest with yourselves, all right, because we're going to trust that God's Word is going to do that with us. So I want to continue. I told you I'd continue with a few more questions. Here's a few more questions to kind of get us thinking here um, before, again, we dive into this. How many of you have ever had difficult people in your life? You don't need to answer. Don't raise your hands or anything like that, okay? Just kind of think about this. Again, we're just doing some personal reflection right now, and this is going to help us as it kind of um, gets ready again to hop into four. And so how many of you have ever had some difficult people in your life? Now, out of those difficult people in your life, how many of you have ever wondered why God would allow those difficult people to be in your life? Okay, think about that one. Out of the difficult people that God has allowed in your life, 
of those, you're now wondering, why? Why would God allow that difficult person to be in my life? Anybody ever felt like that? I know we're not answering out loud and just silently in our own hearts. That's okay. How many of you are sitting next to those difficult... Just joking. Okay. <laughs> we'll skip that one. Don't. Do not. Yeah, I am right here. All right. Uh, move past. Being very now honest with ourselves, how many of you have ever viewed those individuals as more of a hassle and an irritation rather than an opportunity for spiritual growth? Uh, my my brother-in-law, his name is Ken, we used to have this saying when, when we were uh, kind of doing youth ministry together, whenever we would come across a difficult person, we would look at each other and we would just say, it's another great opportunity for spiritual growth, Right? And what we were meaning is it's on our side, that as we're interacting with this difficult person, it's an opportunity for us to experience some spiritual growth. And so we would joke about that because we felt like it was necessary for us to um, have that kind of, of mindset. So think about some of those questions here this morning as we hop in now to Jonah chapter 4. Um, when I interact with difficult people in my life, um, I, I've learned some things over the years. Um, I've learned to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, I have not always been like that. I was a teenager once, too, who I would say there were times in my life where I was just kind of pretty, pretty rude, you know what I mean? And I didn't like it when people were mean to me, you know, and we've all been there and we get that. But I've learned through the years being a part of ministry and just growing in my walk with the Lord to just give people the benefit of the doubt. I've learned as I encounter those difficult people to try and look deep into a person's heart and to understand the best way that I can that person's mind, and I know that's impossible to do sometimes, but to also understand that every person is a human being who has been, been created in the image of God. And so when I encounter a difficult person, and the difficulty begins to happen, that's what happens in my mind as I begin to look at that person, number one, first and foremost, as a person who's created in the image of God. And that person is like me. And I, I try to have some of those mindsets as I encounter those people in my life. Um, some other things that I try to understand is that not only um, are, have they been created in the image of God, um, but I've also learned throughout the years that, that that person is a human being, and every person who does not know Jesus is hurting in some way. So a lot of what we're talking about this morning is not necessarily the other Christians in our life who can be difficult, and I know that never happens in our church either, but I'm talking about Specifically honing in and focusing on, on those unsaved people, those people who are not walking with the Lord that you and I know that this just seemed to make life quite difficult for each of us this morning. We're kind of focusing really on those people. If God brings other people to your mind, that's fine. I'll trust that he'll work in that way as well. But we're kind of looking at those people who don't know Jesus. And so when I encounter a person who doesn't know Jesus, I look at that person as maybe they're acting that way because that person is hurting significantly in some way in their life. I probably learned this skill from my dad who has taught me more about grace than any other person who I have ever met in my entire life. It's true. If you've known my dad, I think you would um, agree with that statement. My dad loved God, and he genuinely loved people. And he often saw the good in others even when they were bad. <laughs> That's just my dad. And he was able to extend grace in those difficult moments to those difficult people in ways that my jaw would just drop. And growing up, I had the opportunity in, to really observe him interact with difficult people honestly, in, in countless episodes of my life, watching him interact with difficult people and taking notes and learning just how he did that um, has taught me so much of how I interact with people. Just to tell you a quick story, um, the last week of his life, as he was struggling very... Um, and he himself was having some deep, difficult moments physically, as he was literally hours away from the end of his life before he would enter the arms of the, his Lord and Savior. And he was having some rough patches. He wasn't feeling good, and, and um, we noticed that he was getting a little snippy with some of the nurses, and I didn't think anything of it. 
These were hospice nurses doing their job, and they didn't think anything of it at, at all. And, and I, I gave him a pass because he's hurting. He's not feeling well at all physically, emotionally, mentally. All of that is happening within his life during these moments, and I, and I just let it go. And I remember later that day, I was um, helping him to kind of process the day as I could tell he was having some difficulties, and he was clearly distracted and bothered. And he told me, I'm so upset with myself right now. Here's a man who's hours away from his life on earth coming to a close. And he's seriously upset with his life right now. I said, Dad, what, what do you mean? What's, what's going on? He said, I, I, am, I am not happy with the way that I've been interacting. And I'm not happy with my behavior today and how I've interacted with these people who are caring for me. I couldn't believe it. That's my dad. That's grace. So I learned in those episodes of observing his life how he extended grace to people. And many times he would extend the grace to people who I think he had a right to not extend grace to them. <laughs> but he did it anyways because he knows that that's the attitude and the mind of Christ. And he knew that that's the attitude that he should have. I can let you into my pastor's mind for a few moments. I'd like to explain somehow I interact with people who I see going about my daily interactions with life from wherever God takes me from the grocery store to the Home Depot to the restaurant as I encounter the, the waitress or the waiters who are serving my family, whatever it is. And you and I meet those people who seems to be like they're sucking on a lemon. And you know what I mean by that, right? It's an individual who's not having a good day, and they want everybody else to also not have a good day, right? You will meet one later today, probably, all right, and you will remember this story. And in those moments, my mind, I've kind of told you kind of a little bit about how I interact with people kind of in that setting and what kind of begins to go through my mind, but I'm just going to kind of help um, you um, just kind of share a little bit more on what I do. I immediately take that person who wants everybody else to have a rough day I immediately take that person on as a project. I'm serious. I look at it as a personal project. And God has placed me right there in the middle of that difficult person in that difficult situation. And I look at it as God giving me a project. And here's the project that I'm faced with for that day during that hour. And so for the next four minutes, as the lady behind the counter at Publix is scanning my groceries and she is mad, right? And you know it scanning and just typing away and everything. For those four minutes that I have to step into that young person's life or that elderly person's life who's ringing me up, I take her on as a project and I begin to think, what can I say or do to encourage her in some way that maybe not one other person today has said anything kind to her at all? What can I do? And so I think and I, I try to turn that person around in that little short window of time and to help extend grace to them. And they don't deserve it, do they? But I'm going to extend to them that grace. I'll take the 45 minutes that I have when the waiter comes and they're mad and they're taking our order and they're mad because our family's so huge and so it's seven people and they got to serve all these drinks, different drinks and everything else to different people and our food comes and everybody's got no onions on this and this and that and you can sense that they're just writing everything down and they're angry. I'm like, oh great, another project for the next 45 minutes, right? And we try to pour into that person's life and try to be as kind as we can, try to be as compassionate that we can to extend grace as best we can and try to turn that person around. And, and I'll tell you that more times than not, by the end of that hour window, 45 minutes of time, we find out that that waitress will begin to share something with us that we never asked about. And she'll say, you know, I'm just having a, a stinky day and I'm, and I'm sorry. Sometimes we'll even get that. They begin to apologize, or they begin to then tell me what happens. And we've had waiters just say, I just lost my sister like three days ago, you know. I'm like, oh my goodness. And it gives us opportunities. It gives us a glimpse into the window of their life so we can understand a little bit about why they are so rude that day and what's happening. And I know I have a right. At least we think we have a right, right, according to our culture today. If they're mean, then I'm going to be mean because they don't deserve my grace today. And that's what we think. 
and I have the right to demand respect. But I push my, quote, rights aside, and I start by extending grace because they need grace. And maybe God has sent them to me in this little window of time to be a person of grace, even if for four minutes while they check my groceries out through the line. And this is something that I've learned over the years. I'm still learning, and I almost make it into a game, and I have fun with it as well, and it tends to make the rudeness a little easier to handle. So with my words or with my smile or even my good tip that's not deserved, I'm hoping that in some way I can extend grace. Grace, it's this word that means unmerited favor. It means you, you, you don't earn it. You, you can't earn it. And God in His grace, right, has given you opportunities for salvation, right? For by grace are you saved through faith, right? You don't deserve it either. Now, does this mean that I never get upset with others who mistreat me? You can ask my family that, and I'll let them answer for you, um, or for me. Um, there are times when I, too, am human, just like you, where I get stressed out, I'm tired, I have bad days, and I feel like the rude person sometimes, and we all know how that is. One area that's tough for me is um, overlooking certain driving behaviors. Um, and we'll just leave that one on the side. I heard an amen there. That's good. But I'm a work in progress, just like you and I, and we'll leave that there. But don't be so fooled to think, and I can't be so fooled to think, that you and I always want what God wants, that you and I always value what God values, that you and I are always excited about the situations that God calls you in. Because God, for some reason, wants you in that situation. Many times the problems for us is that we, we don't want those difficult people to be graced because we don't think that they deserve it. In fact, instead of being graced, we want them to be judged. Because that would be better, wouldn't it? It seems right to us. And you and I will come up against people in our lives where it will be hard for us to actually want the love and grace of God to be showered down on them. And the reason that we don't want that bottom line is because in those moments, we are not sharing the heart of God. I think Jonah is having a God amnesiac moment. Remember that? Where he's forgetting God in this moment, and he's not sharing the heartbeat of God in Jonah chapter 4. I'm learning and being challenged within this little passage of Jonah that it's the heart of God that would transform our surrounding relationships if only we would pray that our heart would be more in sync with his heart to see every single surrounding situation less of a disappointment, less of an irritation, and more of an opportunity. And maybe the opportunity is for you to receive spiritual growth, right? Maybe. Growing up, for me, one of the favorite verses was in Psalm 37, 4, and it's this verse that says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I've written that on many a graduation cards for students who've graduated high school and encouraging them and helping them. And I think when I first memorized that verse, I didn't really fully understand really what this desire, delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. I think I kind of fast forwarded to the desires of my heart and thought that, oh, great, anything I desire that God's going to give me, right? And that's just not the truth of what this means. In fact, if you go to the next verse, it even says, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. So we continue to look at the context there. But taking delight in the Lord means that our hearts truly find peace and fulfillment in Him and in Him alone. And if we truly find satisfaction and worth in Christ, this little verse says that He will give you the desires of your heart. doesn't mean that anything you desire, as long as you're finding peace in God, that He'll automatically bless you with or give that to you. That's called prosperity gospel, right? And the problem with prosperity gospels is it's just not biblical. It's not true. It's nowhere do we find that in, in God's Word. The idea behind this verse is that when you and I truly and authentically rejoice, when we truly and authentically delight in the things that God delights in, that our desires and our hearts begin to beat more in sync with His heart and His desires. 
And then when that happens, our desires become more like God's desires and we will experience a satisfying peace because the things that God wants are slowly becoming the things that you and I want. Matthew 6, is another great one, right? But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you, right? Another verse that's very similar to Psalm 37, 4. I'm convinced that if only we would learn to take the light in the things that God delights in, if only we would learn to adopt the heart of God and make His invisible grace visible through the various interactions within our life, then I believe that it would radically change all of our surrounding relationships. I'll leave that on the screen and let that soak in for a bit. If you and I are to constantly and consistently be renovating our life, that's a part of our mission as the Gulf View people, right? We want to reflect, we want to rescue, we want to renovate. If this idea of renovation is something that's important to us as God's people, understanding the fact that we've never arrived, that we're all growing, that we're all learning in our walk with Jesus, that we're all constantly renovating our life in Christ, then each of us should be on a path towards adopting the heart of God within our life. Do you have more of God's heart today than you once had? Let that question soak in for a second. Do you have more of God's heart today than you once had? Just go back a year ago. Go back a few months ago. How are you growing and how is that process happening? Hopefully you can say yes and praise God that I do, that this is happening, that I'm noticing these things are happening within my life, that I'm having more of the heart of God being shown within my life. And again, none of us will arrive at this. will be a continual work, and sometimes it'll be a battle as we learn to be comfortable in the difficult situations and even in these difficult relationships that God might move us to. As we read these first few verses now of Jonah chapter 4, it's going to reveal this struggle. And so that, that long introduction is kind of what's helping us now to grasp these four little tiny verses, um, and hopefully it will begin to make sense to each of us as God's Word now is shared um, to us. It's going to reveal with us the struggle that each of us have between conceding to the heart of God and what I call listening to the heart of man. It's a consistent struggle that we have. We're either conceding to God's heart or we're listening to the heart of man. We're actually um, adopting God's values and character within our own life or we're ignoring that and adopting our own. It's this consistent struggle that we have. Do I obey God's heart or not? Do I obey God's heart or do I obey my own selfish heart? Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, completely in the opposite direction of Nineveh. We remember that. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Four chapters ago, if you remember as our story of Jonah began, studying his autobiography, you remember that God called Jonah to go to this wicked city of Nineveh. I want to remind ourselves again of Nineveh. We've been here, we've looked at it, we've studied it, but it's important for us to remind this again. Nineveh eventually became the capital city of Assyria, the Assyrian Empire, known for its ruthless military conquests and their wicked, cruel treatment of their captured enemies. I want to share a little bit more detail that I kind of hesitated to share when we first talked about this because it's just so gruesome, but I want you to understand this is how the mind of the Ninevites worked. They were so ruthless that when they would capture an enemy from an opposing army, they would slowly dismember them, and then they would mock them as they would lose their life. And they were known for this. In fact, they have once been called the appalling lords of torture. And I just want us to remember what Jonah's seemingly outrageous and irrational call to mission was. God was calling him to go to those people who are known for those kinds of horrible, wicked, evil things. And all along the path of God's call, 
we, we've noticed that Jonah has been kind of rebelling against God, and we understand that because I think we too would be rebelling in some of those moments. And he's acting in disobedience until finally in Jonah chapter 3, there's like this turning point that happens within Jonah's life. He finally heeds God's call to go, maybe a bit reluctantly at first, and he kind of has these serious rock bottom moments as he finds himself in the bottom of the ocean, right? And now he's in this intimate time with God, and he's beginning to pray, and he has this turning point. He says, I'll go. I think it's real. He ends up in Nineveh, proclaiming now a message of judgment that God gave him that message to declare. And the residents of Nineveh heeded God's warning, and they repented in the hope that God would relent and spare them. And in, an un, in a remarkable turn of events, God spared them. But, God, but what God did was so terrible to Jonah, one version says, that he burned with anger. Chapter 4, verse 1. And this reaction from a loving prophet of God is absolutely shocking and inexplicable, right, for us to think about. This is a prophet of God who's burning with anger. So Jonah is displeased, the ESV says, greatly displeased, and that displeasure was pointed directly at God. And that displeasure slowly led Jonah to anger, and that's the word that's captured for us here in chapter 4. I believe that Jonah was not just angry, but I tend to think that he was furious. He was furious. Why then, when Jonah has just preached really to the toughest audience of his life, and they have responded positively down to the last person, would he now melt down in furious rage because they're actually listening to his sermon? Doesn't make sense, does it? What's going on? Well, believe it or not, uh, there's a lot of theologians that have various interactions or various ideas as they've kind of dissected this passage. And so it appears that Jonah yells at God, but it's very interesting what Jonah does here. Notice what he says, and we'll highlight this part for us. He says, oh Lord, please, just take my life. It would be better for me to lose my life than for me to witness you extending grace to such a wicked people. You know how low this is for Jonah? Oh, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to, li to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Oh, Lord, isn't this what I spoke of when I was in my country and you first called me to this mission? I just knew that you might do something like this, he's saying. These people are evil and they are only changed because they were scared. They only changed because you warned them of your impending judgment. That's why they changed. They didn't convert and start worshiping you. We don't see that anywhere documented for us in chapter 4. They merely promised to start changing, and you bestow mercy on them for that. It's good that you're a God of mercy, and it's good that you're a God of grace, but this time, God, I think you've gone too far. When Jonah begins his conversation with God, he refers to him as Lord. If you do a study of this, this phrase here where he says, O oh Lord, it's the word Yahweh, and he literally cries, Alas, Yahweh. Alas, O oh Lord. The word Yahweh, we're familiar with that. It's the personal covenant name of God, the unpronounceable name of God, which he reveals only to his people, Israel, and it's the covenant of God with Israel that appears to be on Jonah's mind, even in this time. I think he's saying, that, Lord, you promised to preserve Israel and to care for your people and accomplish your purposes in the world through us. How then can you, God, keep your promises to uphold your people at the same time showing your great mercy and grace to our enemies? It doesn't make sense. How can he claim to be a God of justice and yet allow such evil and violence to go unpunished? How would God dare offer his grace to the wicked, evil people of Nineveh? Then Jonah, as he's having this intimate, pleading, argument, furious moment as he's 
deep in his conversation now with God, questioning God. I, I think he's shouting almost at God, it seems. He then begins to quote Scripture, or some say misquote Scripture, because he leaves part of the story out. And in his case with God, he uses God's own word against God. This is, this is pretty wild. Notice what he says. I'm going to show both of these words, Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. And I'm going to show the passage that Jonah is, is um, kind of um, using to quote back to God as he's having this debate. So Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, it says, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. That's not just a catchphrase that Jonah had. That's actually scripture that Jonah is, is recording that his people would have known and would have memorized. And so he says, or so it says in Exodus 34, 6 and 7, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. If you look at just that phrase, it appears that um, he's, he's leaving part of the story out. What part of the story is he leaving out? If you look at it, we'll just kind of, here's kind of how you can see the comparison. Gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. And then we see he's repeating that again. Gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. But then the part of the story here that he's leaving it out is, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He's leaving that part out of the character of God. Remember last week, we, we talked about this picture of, of God is, is not just a God of love, but a God of love who loves you so much to allow judgment to take place. How a loving God is also a God who brings judgment, a God who balances both grace and truth within our lives. But here Jonah is leaving this part out of his view of God in order, I think, to justify his anger and his bitterness. So Jonah says, oh God, I, I knew you were going to do this. I knew you were going to extend and offer your redemptive plan to this wicked people, and this is exactly why I was reluctant in the first place to go to these people. What is the big hang-up for Jonah? What, what's the big distress in Jonah's life that is making him angry? Think about that. What do you think it is? You don't need to just answer quietly, but... What is the biggest distress, the biggest hang-up in Jonah's life right now that's making him angry? I think it's God's grace. He's furious with God's grace. There are moments in my life when I would rather God express justice than grace. There are moments when I would rather God express punishment than forgiveness. There are moments when I am just not on the same page, the same loving, redemptive plan that God is on, right, in my life. I think you probably would agree. If you're a parent, then you can relate to this example. And even if you're not a parent, you can relate because you were once a child who thought that everything revolved around your selfish life, right? It's 11 o'clock p.m. and now way past bedtime and your kids are supposed to be soundly sleeping in bed so that you can actually have some peace and quiet before you begin to turn in around midnight and your kids are getting a little crazy and out of hand and for some reason grandma gave them extra sugar and they're staying up bouncing off the walls or for whatever reason they're awake, right? And you're now going down the hallway for the fourth time of the night getting ready to once again confront them in their behavior so that they would stop, they would be obedient, that they would be quiet, and they would just go to bed. And there you are as you're marching down the hallway to the bedroom. You are probably in this moment not thinking, thank you, God, for my, my children who even at this moment are being disobedient. But you are allowing me and placing me in this difficult situation for such a time as this. <laughs> so that I can be used to extend your great grace and mercy to my children who are being disobedient. Right? It's probably not what you're thinking at this late hour of the night when you yourselves are tired. Now you're going to lose sleep and it's going to be a very difficult day tomorrow. Um, but rather you're thinking, that's it. I'm done. I'm going to jail because my kids are dead. Um, <laughs> I guess, don't have to worry about tomorrow, don't worry about sleep, it's over. And, and so you're thinking this because at this point, you're not sharing God's heart. At, at that point, your heart is not beating in sync with 
God's heart. And you're not thinking that God has called you into the lives of these wild, little, precious, out-of-control little ones to help them learn and grow and be obedient, to understand God's forgiveness, to understand the importance of obedience, and to understand this beautiful word we call grace. Deuteronomy, I've told you this a million times, one of my favorite passages there where it just talks about how we interact with our kids. Deuteronomy says that you, you do this constantly. You do this when you lie down. You do this when you're tucking them in at night. You do this when you get up in the morning and you're eating omelets for breakfast. You do this on their way out as they grab a Pop-Tart and they're on their way to the bus. You do this when you're out and about in life and you're just doing life and you're meeting the mean people or the rude people who are checking your groceries out, who are serving your family. Every single opportunity is or situation is an opportunity for you to pour into their lives and to teach them about his mercy, his forgiveness, his truth, and his grace. And you, parents, in those moments are a tool in God's hands to minister to your kids. But we don't always look at it as grace. I think often it's more of a hassle or an interruption. But we need to learn that it's always opportunities for God's grace. Paul David Tripp, an author, and I've been and one of the resources um, that I've been looking at for Jonah, he says, God makes his invisible grace visible by sending people of grace to give grace to people who need grace. God makes his invisible grace visible by sending people of grace to give grace to people who need grace. It was that quote that just kind of captured my heart this week and became the reason why I even called our title, our sermon, Invisible Grace. And this invisible grace is not in this moment capturing Jonah's heart. In chapter 4, Jonah is viewing the people of Nineveh more as a hassle. He's viewing the people of Nineveh more as an irritation, as an inconvenience, as sinners who live in a wicked city who are beyond the love and the grace and the mercy of God. That's how Jonah right now is viewing these people of Nineveh. I want to discover a few things, and we try to kind of wrap some of this up. There's kind of just a, a few points that I kind of want to leave you with that I believe Jonah is lacking now in his spiritual life. So as, as, as Jonah is having these interactions with God, it seems to be a bit of a, an up and down kind of moment, right? And, and I think we've all been there, and that's why we can resonate with his life so much. One minute he's, he's disobeying and running, and the next minute he's on his knees praying, right? And so this is kind of happening with him, and so he's lacking several things in his life. And in chapter 4, I just, as we kind of look at his words and this intimate interaction, I think there's four, really three things that specifically that he's lacking. They're not on the screen, so you just have to kind of listen intently here, but I believe that the first thing that Jonah is lacking is compassion. He's lacking compassion. Jonah says, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. And this is the entire reason why I didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. Jonah is lacking compassion. One commentator says, Jonah makes the hope of the universe sound like a character defect. This is how messed up we can become in our thinking. And he goes on to say that we can play back the beauty of God as if it's ugly, the good things of God as if they are not the good things. Ultimately, Jonah is disappointed with God's character. That's what Jonah's wrestling with here. He's disappointed and he's frustrated with the character of God, the creator of the universe, that he is a God of grace. And in those times when you and I are struggling with what God is about to do and you're telling yourself that maybe you're smarter than God and that you got it all figured out and you might know more than him and you want to push him off the throne and that your instincts are better than God's purposes and plan, I think you, like Jonah, are lacking compassion. I believe Jonah 4 is really here to help be a mirror for us in order that you and I can look deep within our own heart to see if there are places within our heart where we might also be disappointed with God. Going back to those first questions that we asked, are there places where you wish that God wasn't really like he was? Are there places where you wish that God didn't act in the character that he has and displays? Are there places where you wish that God wasn't so forgiving? I think in Jonah's case, it's 
it's a, a pretty developed sense of what we would call self-righteousness to argue that the grace of God isn't a good thing. Because as I think about this and as I'm reading and understanding this, because the only person who can ever argue that the grace of God isn't a good thing is a person who is convinced that they don't need the grace of God. Think about Jonah's story. The very grace that forgave Jonah's life for his comfortable indifference. The very grace that patiently pursued Jonah when he ran. The very grace that lovingly spared Jonah's life in the midst of that chaotic storm. The very grace that preserved Jonah's life in the middle of a fish where God bent the laws of nature and and provided a miracle. The very grace that gave Jonah a second chance when God didn't have to, but he did. The very grace that even allows an angry prophet to cry out in his most serious moment of distress to actually speak to the creator of the universe in intimate, holy prayer. And God gave him the time of day and listened. That's grace. And this is the very grace that Jonah is arguing against. It's like he's forgetting all of these grace moments that he has had within his own life as he's dealing now with the difficult people of Nineveh. This passage is one of those passages that so reveals the dark areas of our heart and shines some light on those areas, and I think it exposes them for what they are. It's a tough one. I told you in the beginning, it's a tough passage for us because I think it's so helpful and so beneficial because I think every single one of us can wrestle with what Jonah is wrestling with. I want you to know that when, when I study, when I prepare to preach almost what appears to be every week of my life, um, that there is not a week that goes by where I am not convicted myself and challenged myself as I study God's Word. Um, just a few nights ago, I was rehearsing some of this with my wife and um, just wrapping my head around all of this and the importance of extending grace to others even when they don't deserve it and, and how in that we make Jesus so beautiful and so good, right? We remind people that he's the answer and just sharing with my wife just of what I've been learning. I couldn't even talk because I've been so moved by these four verses. And my prayer has been that, um, that these four verses are going to profoundly move you as well because I feel like they're so important for us as we each are reaching a lost community and we're each stepping into people's lives on a regular basis. So I believe that every preacher must be his first congregation. And so I'm listening to my words today. One resource I referenced this week says, You know that you are in deep spiritual trouble when the sin of others concerns you more than your own. That's so challenging. My dad used to say, uh, Be careful when you point at someone because there's four fingers pointing back. I always disagree with him. I'm like, Dad, how can you get four fingers pointed back? Because my thumb's always going forward. Um, then he would kind of laugh. He said, well, I mean three. You know. um, but it's, it's true. Jonah was lacking compassion for others because he was lacking concern for his own spiritual life. He was lacking concern. When you and I are focusing more on the sin of others than we are on our own sin, the emotional relational result of that will be irritation impatience, judgment, and condemnation. But when I'm thinking of the depth of my own sin and my own deep need for God's grace and I encounter another difficult person, let me tell you, it puts your mind in a totally, completely different perspective. God wants extended grace to you. You and I had better extend grace to others. And Jonah was lacking compassion. And we believe that as followers of Jesus, we too need compassion for others But another thing that Jonah was lacking as we understand this quote here about recognizing their sin more than our own, I I think he he was lacking was confession. I'm learning that deep relational compassion is fueled by deep personal confession. Deep relational compassion is fueled by deep personal confession. 
Because when I come to the point where I understand and confess that I am more like that other person who's being difficult, right? It changes things. When I'm more like that other person that I care to admit, when I confess that I too am a human being in need of God's grace, it changes the entire way that I interact with that person and relate to them. Because to condemn them would be to condemn myself. Because to say that there's no hope for them would be to say that there's really then no hope for me. And if they are beyond the reach of God's grace, then I too am beyond the reach of God's grace. A little verse came into my mind this week in studying, and I don't know why it just popped in my mind, and so I share it with you, and it's 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and it says, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. In this passage, the Apostle Paul is kind of having this conversation with the, uh, the people of Corinth here, and he's highlighting some events of Israel's history in and, and a way to tell the people of Corinth to be very, very careful. When you as a church begin to think that you've got it all together, and you think you're standing firm, you better be careful lest you fall. You too are just as in need of God's grace as the world is. And he's saying, just like Israel had discovered that their spiritual pride is, was a powerful deceiver for them, the same thing can happen to you. So be careful when you think you're all that, because you're not. After all that Jonah has been through in his life, he still lacks the full life-altering recognition of the depth of his own sin. That's how I gather it. He thinks he's standing firm. And because of that, he's so selfishly full of pride, and he says, God, what makes me mad is your grace. Do you and I have any sense of what we've been rescued from within our sinful past and often our sinful lives. Do you and I have any sense of what sin is still at times rearing its ugly head in our lives? You couldn't possibly say the things that Jonah is saying. Oh God, I am mad at the grace that you are extending to those people. Jonah's story is teaching us so much about ourselves and about culture and about the lost and about people who need the love of Jesus, just like you. And this often is our struggle. As we close in prayer, I just want to ask a couple of questions here, and I'm kind of forwarding to the end and skipping some of this. And Is there any areas of your life today where you are disappointed with God? I come back to that question. Are there areas in your life today where God might be sending you and you are lacking contentment being in the will of God in your life? Something that you're dealing with maybe within your life through a relationship that you have with a friend, through a work issue that's happening, through a family relationship, whatever it is. Are, those, um, so are there areas where you're lacking contentment? Maybe God's placing you there to go for the fourth time down the hallway to interact with that person who needs grace? Are you lacking contentment with the difficult mission that God might be calling you to? Is there anyone in your life that you view as a hassle or an irritation? Why do you think that God has put you in his or her life? Why do you think that God has put you in his or her life? We need to pray that we would convincingly have the heart of God, that our hearts would be renovated to be more and more in sync with his, and then he will give us the desires of our heart because our desires are becoming what his desires are. Remember our last little plug statement here that I think is so beautiful is God makes his invisible grace visible by sending people of grace to give grace to people who need grace. Hey.